one on. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. If I may have your attention, I'm Ed Jeregin, the director of the Baker Institute, and I warmly welcome you all this, uh, <clears throat> this morning to our conference. Um, this is the second conference of our presidential uh, elections program. The uh, Baker Institute has had a focus on United States presidents. As many of you may know, last year the Institute celebrated its 25th anniversary under the slogan, A Quarter of a Century uh, Making History, with President Barack Obama as our guest of honor at our anniversary gala. <clears throat> With President Obama's presence here, we are very happy to note that the Institute has now hosted every living former President of the United States since we opened our doors in 1994. We have built a nonpartisan, data-driven research uh, programs that are recognized as top resources for decision makers on the local, national, and global level. Simultaneously, as you can see here, we have become a premier forum for the discussion and debate of public policy. We're ranked as the third best university <clears throat> think tank in the world, preceded by the London School of Economics, uh, their Ideas Center, and Harvard's Belfer Center. The idea itself to create a presidential elections program came from our honorary chair, Secretary James A. Baker III who, having managed five presidential campaigns, thought it was very important to develop a nonpartisan resource to study presidential elections per se, especially given the experience of 2016. Our inaugural conference in March 2018, entitled Social Media, Changing Demographics and Implications of the 2016 Presidential Election, proved to be a very insightful and timely exchange that helped to con contextualize the complex factors at play in the last election. As our co-directors at that inaugural conference, we had Carl Rove and David Axelrod, which shows you the bipartisan nature of uh, what we're doing here. The title of this year's conference, A Presidential Election in an Uncertain Time, certainly an uncertain time, is very apt for our country's present and challenging moment as we approach the elections in 2020. We are delighted to have as co-directors for this conference, Mary Madeline and James Carville, uh, who will be with us uh, shortly if they're not here uh, already. Regardless of one's political affiliation, I think we can all broadly agree that political polarization is a critical issue within our body politic and our society. This polarization is only further exacerbated by a lack of trust in political leaders, media, and institutions that form the very backbone of our government founded by our founding fathers. This conference's participants will address these topics head on. In addition to describing the complex attitudes and issues present in our current uh, political environment. Today's panelists will also analyze the underlying mechanics of our system of government by exploring primaries and caucuses and their role in the 2020 election. This is of particular importance given our location in Texas, a key state for presidential primary campaigns and critical fundraising efforts for uh, any candidate. So ultimately, the Presidential Elections Program is a valuable asset to the national study of American politics, and I'm confident that today's uh, conference will be engaging and informative. So allow me now to welcome Ed Emmett, the former ha Harris County judge and currently a professor in the practice of public policy at Rice University, a senior fellow at Rice's Kinder Institute for Urban Research, and a fellow at Rice's Door Institute for New Leaders. Ed will introduce our first panel on rising polarization in the country. So welcome Ed Emmett to the podium. 
You have to be nimble in this business. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I had about 60 seconds that I was allowed to say, and I'm going to say it before I introduce the panelists. Uh, rising polarization, what a great topic. And if you're as old as I am, and perhaps some of you are in this audience, uh, we think it's a new topic, but it's really not. My first presidential race of any memory was 1964, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. But I also teach a course here at Rice which asks the question, does policy drive societal change or does societal change drive policy? And the answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> Depends on the issue. And in talking to the students, they're very smart, they're very intelligent, uh, but history sometimes escapes them. So I thought back to the 1972 presidential race, not the general election, but the Democratic primary. Who won the two, who were the two leading candidates in terms of primaries and caucuses won? George McGovern and George Wallace. Both were in the Democratic primary. You talk about polarization. And it wasn't that George Wallace just won Southern states. He won states like Maryland. He did well in Michigan and Wisconsin. So this is a fascinating topic. And this morning, uh, we have a wonderful panel to, to start off. And I would ask them all to come up as I introduce them in alphabetical order, and then they'll speak in a different order just to confuse you. Uh, their, their bios are, are in your pamphlet. But first is John D. Arnold. Uh, He's a former hedge fund manager and natural gas trader. But more importantly, he and his wife, Laura, have kind of dedicated their lives to better public policy. And so, uh, John, if you'll come on up and, and take your seat. He focuses on philanthropy through Arnold Ventures, LLC, where they really dive into evidence-based policy, research, and advocacy in a wide range of topics from criminal justice to public finance. So, John, welcome. And you are allowed to applaud as these people are. <laughs> Second panelist is Stephen Hawkins, a director of research at More in Common. And I confess, until this, I didn't know what More in Common was. I would ask you to read more about it. But his whole focus is leading studies on polarization and division, not only in the US, but across Europe. And I believe More in Common actually started in, in the UK. Is that correct? So Stephen, welcome to uh, Rice University and, and <laughs> the Baker Institute. And finally, Jeff Lewis is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of California. I have not met Jeff yet. Jeff? I'm here. OK. <laughs> Good. He was at the different table from me. Jeff, come on up while I uh, tell him who you are. He's currently the president of the Society for Political Methodology, uh, researches and teaches in the areas of quantitative methodology, elections, direct democracy, etc. Uh, so he's the one that's probably going to give you the quiz at the end of this first panel. So, so pay careful attention. So. With that in mind, each panelist will present for about 15 minutes. Uh, while they are presenting, please write questions down on your cue cards, because if you don't ask questions, and I have to ask all the questions, and I don't want to do that this morning, and I'm sure there will be lots, and uh, staff will gather them up and bring them up here throughout the presentation. So all, all questions will be held until the end, though, until all three panelists have presented. So uh, first. Let's hear from Stephen Hawkins. Good morning. Am I audible? Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's true that More in Common is an international organization. We were founded in 2017 in the context of the rising concerns in Europe 
following the migrant crisis, what was called the migrant crisis, refugees flowing in from Syria, Afghanistan, Northern Africa into Western Europe, and the turbulent political environment that engendered from that. In that context um, was the context in which Member of Parliament Joe Cox was killed by one of her constituents for her support for accepting refugees and migrants into the United Kingdom. And it was friends and family of Joe Cox that set up More in Common as an organization intended to further understand and explore and explain these problems of rising polarization and division in Western democracies. So my job as the director of research is to lead these efforts, and we've conducted studies together with leading international polling firms since 2016 in the countries of Germany, France, Italy, Greece, Netherlands, United States. And we're um, keenly interested not just in um, understanding these issues, but how we can build societies that are more inclusive and resilient, where people have a stronger sense of shared identity that can weather the difficulties of the conflicts and the problems that we're facing together. So our research explores different perspectives. We're concerned about how these divisions, lines of division are drawn, and we want to convey them accurately. So looking beyond demographics and partisanship, we explore attitudinal differences and how those form into clusters by looking at patterns in people's psychology, and we use a lot of quantification statistical inference as well as qualitative research to undertake that work. And finally, we also test interventions. As we have conducted this research and presented around the world, the initial questions that we get back are always the same. What do we do? And so we have now taken on some early efforts to explore what it might look like from the standpoint of communications and events and organizational behavior that might actually bring about some of the changes to these problems that we're describing. So I just want to talk through five insights from the last two years of the original research that we've conducted here in the United States. The first is that polarization is indeed deep and significant, and it's driven by these identities which are defined in opposition to each other. Now, this is what's referred to in academia as affective polarization. It's a simple mutual dislike for each other. So I'm summarizing a little bit here just to round up, but to just give a sense of proportion, nine in 10 Americans agree, um, at least slightly or strongly agree, sorry, somewhat or strongly agree that this is the most divided we have felt in our lifetimes, or in their lifetime, sorry. And then here the graphic which I have displayed shows that People will describe, as Republicans, they'll describe Democrats as brainwashed, hateful, and racist at a level of four, five, six, or seven out of seven, about 90% of the time, and vice versa. And while the, we ask the question, how would you describe members of your own party, they'll describe themselves as honest and reasonable and caring. The other side is the one that's racist and brainwashed and hateful. Nine in 10 Americans will say that the po political conflict is strong in the United States, and that's a higher level than class conflict or racial conflict. Another one of my favorite statistics is that when the discussion of racism was very alive and we're trying to, in the political science community, measure the extent of racism, one of the key metrics was whether people felt a degree of concern or would be bothered by their son or daughter marrying into another race. And that number, in the political context now has reached very high levels. In 1960, about 4% of Americans say, I wouldn't want, as a Republican, I wouldn't want my daughter to marry a Democrat, and the other way around. Today, those numbers have increased about tenfold to 30, 40%. And so polarization has become, or politics in the United States more broadly, has become a conflict of identities and values. So here we have two very different subjects, the subject of the impact of immigration and the subject of sexual harassment. We've used a forced binary question here, which is that it's not the best methodology for everything, but if you're trying to see which way people lean between two interpretations of a complex phenomenon, this is what we used here. And if you look at the national level, you see that these issues divide the country in half, 50-50 more or less. But if you look below to the typology system we've developed, our seven hidden tribes that we released, you see that there's a very consistent 
consistent pattern in the degree to which people align with one perspective or the other. And on the extreme wings, the progressive activists on the left and the devoted conservatives on the right, you see that there is almost a uniformity of opinion. There is a consensus of which direction they feel on issues that are very unrelated. Immigration, sexual harassment, this is true also of questions of, of race and police brutality. It's true of, of other questions that also have no direct connection thematically to to our politics or to rather to our society, but what's happening is that there's an underlying division in our, in our culture and people are lining up on one side or the other independently of what the issue is. Now what we've interpreted over um, many thousands of interviews that we've conducted is a group we refer to as the exhausted majority. And this is a group that um, we often get this sort of response, a kind of collective self-identification into this group. We think it's about two-thirds of Americans who we describe as feeling forgotten by the political debate, who are more ideologically flexible, and who would like their political leaders to try and find compromise. And this group isn't a permanent group. It's not that people are always in this group or not. Um, oftentimes, what we're seeing is that the political context that you're in leads to some contextualization of whether people fall into the exhausted majority or not. So for instance, in the era of the Obama presidency and the Tea Party, there was more exhaustion on the conservative side than there is now with the current administration. And I wanna talk now about a problem which is referred to as false polarization which is the degree to which we misunderstand and misattribute character, characteristics to our political opponents. So we con conducted a study called the perception gap, and in this study what we asked people to do is to predict the degree to which their political opponents, so if they're a Republican, what Democrats thought, on a, on a small set of about five or six issues, where we asked them what percent, for instance, of Republicans do you think would be supportive of immigration if it's properly controlled. Think, sorry, think that immigration could be good for the country if properly controlled. Or what percent of Democrats do you think support the Second Amendment? And then we asked Republicans and Democrats to tell us, do you support these statements? And then we calculated the gap and created an index from this. And it is a measure of the degree to which we overestimate how different our political opponents are from us. And we found that the more partisan you are, the larger your perception gap, meaning the more you overstate and overestimate and caricature your political opponents. That's what this graphic shows here, that the, those who are less politically engaged, in fact, have a better grasp on what the average Republican or average Democrat might think because they are discovering and understanding their political reality through everyday conversations at work and at home and in the neighborhood rather than through social media and media platforms which tend to emphasize the most partisan voices and create a distorted picture. And of course, the more, the, the larger your perception gap, the more negative your opinion of the other side. And so this, in fact, is slightly good news because it shows that there is a degree to which there is a misperception of how different our political opponents are, and much of the hostility is, in fact, driven by that misperception. And so what we did is we ran a regression analysis to see the degree to which different news sources contribute to this, and so as a regression analysis, we were able to control for demographic factors, age, race, income, as well as partisan identification and ideology, and see the degree to which the consumption of different news sources, which we asked our respondents to provide information to us about, contributed to their misperception of, the political, of their political opponents. And we found that there was a pretty consistent uh, contribution from the media. That is, the more media you consume, the larger your perception gap tends to be. Now, the important caveat here is that ABC, CBS, NBC, <coughs> some of these uh, networks reduce the political, uh, sorry, the perception gap people have. But there are many other news sources, such as the New York Times, and especially some of the more right-wing sources, such as Breitbart, Red State, Sean Hannity, tend to inflame people's misperception of their political opponents.
And so our national discourse amplifies this story of polarization and division. Um, this is a story from the front page of the New York Times that we um, collaborated with Nate Cohn from The Upshot to, to develop, where what we, the, end, the analysis that was undertaken showed the distinction between those active political voices on Twitter and what the Democratic Party and its members look like more generally. And we found that the active liberal voices on Twitter are more educated, more white, and farther to the left by quite a significant margin than the Democratic Party is largely. Now this is a problem for many different actors, whether you are a presidential candidate, whether you are um, a brand, a major brand, or whether you are the Oscars, trying to determine what voices on social media represent the general public or a major constituency versus a narrow thread of society is a real challenge. And from our analysis, it seems that there is a real distorted picture that emerges if you look at social media directly and don't consider who it reflects more broadly. And so we've been partnered, partnering with a social psychologist who's currently based at the University of Pennsylvania to try and draw on some of the best academic literature to help us understand some of these phenomena. We refer to this group of psychological attributes as core beliefs, and these are things which we've drawn heavily from things like moral foundations theory, work done by Jonathan Haidt, as well as work done on authoritarianism by Karen Stenner, and looked at how some of these attributes, which have been shown in other political science and academic literature, to have a relationship to people's political behavior, and we've been discovering how those are relevant in the current political context in the United States. And what we're finding is that the, the most narrow, consistent, and dogmatic and ideological perspectives are really only held in a small minority of the wings of the population, while the vast majority of our country sits in this exhausted majority. And this experience is something which we have explored further, this, this dynamic is something we've explored further through in-depth interviews and focus groups. These are some photos that were taken of participants in our research by the New York Times in a story that Sabrina Tavernese wrote in November of last year. This is Elizabeth from Oregon. She's a veterinarian, a horse veterinarian, and she's pro-choice, and as a result of that has always voted Democrat, but is deeply frustrated by the Democrats' position on immigration, and is also someone who feels that, uh, in a more conservative vein, there needs to be more discipline in society, the younger generations are falling behind, et cetera. And I just are providing these as portraits to illustrate the complexity that we're finding is present in most of the average American and in the exhausted majority that doesn't fit into one consistent psychological pattern. And I just want to close here by talking a little bit about some of the early approaches that we're taking to try and address these problems of polarization. There is the large-scale systemic solutions, which I think John will be speaking to at the level of institutional change, but just at a tactical level of what communication approaches can be taken by organizations immediately, we've been looking at what would it look like to speak across these different psychological orientations that we see on the left and the right in a way that doesn't trigger one side or the other, but instead speaks across the values and across the worldviews that are intention in our political system today. And so we've first did this, we're releasing this study tomorrow. Uh, it's our immigration message testing study. And what we did is after doing an extensive analysis to see what the psychological attributes are that are most at play in the partisan conversation on immigration, we developed messaging that was specifically targeted liberals, at some that was specifically targeted conservatives, and then some that, to my earlier point, speaks in a way that holds the values of both groups in tension and we tested 10 messages. The ones that were the balanced ones speaking across messages performed the best first, second, and third out of the 10. And what that sounds like is instead of saying, for instance, from a liberal perspective, that we need to prioritize, um, though I'll just read it, that our immigration system is too focused on whether someone has legal status and that a priority should not be on building walls but on helping families and individuals who are suffering, that's the liberal perspective. You'll hear that it's emphasizing compassion and care and a sense of universal fairness. This is a very strong orientation on the left. Or the conservative perspective, which is very anchored in authority, 
and instead speaks in a way like this. It bothers me that you can't talk about immigration without being afraid of call being called racist. I don't care about skin color, but I do care about American values and about being safe from gangs and crime and tends to emphasize immigration only in the vein of legal categories, legal and illegal, rather than seeing the humanity of the person. We instead speak about it like this. America can be both strong and compassionate. We can protect our borders at the same time that we welcome immigrants who respect our laws and embrace American values. And that approach we found generated, on average, 78 out of 100 score of agreement across the political spectrum. And we found that the progressive activists on the left and the devoted conservatives agreed with that to the same extent. Meaning, even on the most contentious political issue of our moment, arguably, of immigration, having an informed understanding of the values and the psychology of the competing perspectives in our country can allow us to create communication strategies and hopefully even policies that balance and um, hold in tension these different you know, these different perspectives and speak in a way that Americans overall will agree with. So with that, I will turn it back to the Honorable Judge and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Before I, I ask uh, Professor Lewis to come to the podium, is someone gathering up the questions? We, we, I know we have at least one. Mark, John, somebody, good. Just so if we can start. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Lewis. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, good, good morning. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to be here. Um, as was uh, mentioned before, I am the academic, uh, the PhD holder on this panel, and there, there won't be, there won't be a, a test or a quiz. Um, and I guess I would also note for the record that, that I was not the first one to use um, the words multivariate regression today. <laughs> um, I actually also, maybe a, a little incongruously, um, we'll be talking about uh, a little bit about polarization in the Congress today. Of course, this is more of, a, of an Article II uh, deal than an Article I deal um, today, but um, I think it is important to place um, polarization um, not just at the uh, mass level, but also um, at the elite level as well. And I think looking at members of Congress gives us a, a data-driven way of really thinking about um, how the parties have evolved over time. And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about today. So what we're, gonna, what we're gonna draw on here, what I'm gonna talk about um, is a, a, an, a, data, a data science approach to measuring polarization in the Congress. It's pioneered in the 1980s by Keith Poole and, and Howard Rosenthal. And um, what this method does is allow us to make an ideological mapping or a reduction of all of the votes that members cast in their entire careers um, such that members whose um, voting records are more similar are gonna be placed closer together on a sort of map that we're going to draw um, than members whose, whose voting records are farther apart. So what we want to do is be able to compare um, who's a conservative, who's a liberal, who's one kind of uh, legislator, who's another kind of legislator um, in a very uh, efficient and, and summary way. And then we can think about how um, the positions of legislators and their ideologies have evolved, how their voting records have changed. And I think a good analogy that you can imagine thinking about, you know, how does this work? How does the, we're not going to get into the mathematics of it, but how does it, how does it work? Well, if you think back to the days when um, you want to go on a trip and you would go to the AAA and get a, a paper map, in, um, in one corner of that map, they would have a matrix that would tell you how far it was from, from all the pairs of cities that you might want to visit. And you would, I think, immediately intuit that um, how, they, how, they made that, how they made that matrix, um, they took the map and it got out a ruler and they measured the distance between the cities and then they filled in the entries of that, of that matrix. So what we're gonna do mathematically here is the reverse of that. We're gonna start with that matrix that basically says, hey, um, how far apart are these two members in terms of, of the frequency with which they vote together on, on issues that divide the Congress? and we're gonna to try to reconstruct the map of, of, of cities of distances where they would have to be located in, in some sort of abstract ideological space um, in order to think about that. And again, what that's gonna allow us to do is think about um, over time and even visualize over time um, how the positions of the parties and the members within the parties have changed. And of course, that's in essence um, polarization. <clears throat> 
So if you're interested uh, at the end and, and, and want to look uh, more in, uh, at this kind of analysis, you can go to um, our website, uh, voteview.com, and uh, you can see lots of uh, information about these scores, associated visualizations, um, anything you want to know about Congress. In fact, you can type in your home address. You can see everybody who's ever been the, state, been the uh, member of Congress um, representing that spot of land in the United States. So um, again, how does, how does nominate um, work? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna find a place on this map um, for, every, for every member of the Congress in the entire history of the US Congress. Um, and then each roll call vote that they take, we're gonna represent as a line through that map such that it divides um, the people who would vote yay from the people who would vote nay, or at least as best it can. Of course, it doesn't perfectly predict voting, but it's gonna recapture um, a very large fraction of the 25 million individual roll call choices that members have made over the entire history of Congress. So I'm just gonna give you um, an example of, of what it looks like today. So this is the map we come up with, with today. And, um, and so I've, I've highlighted for you some, some folks that, that you're familiar with. Um, and you can see that the dominant dimension, which is this um, sort of east-west dimension, the left-right um, of your graph that says nominate dimension one, that's what we're gonna really focus on today. Um, it, it, it's gonna capture a lot of what we think about as um, the left-right orientation along a kind of um, tax and spend uh, set of issues and of course a growing set of social issues in the contemporary Congress. And you can see um, folks like, um, like uh, Sylvia Garcia, who, who um, represents a uh, representative from Houston, um, sort of on the left flank along that first dimension, uh, Barbara uh, Lee also on that left flank, and then on the conservative side for the Democrats, um, Connor Lamb, you know, was elected in that special in Pennsylvania. Um, and then on the other side, you can see um, more moderate uh, Republicans like Chris Smith of New Jersey there on the, just uh, across the sort of center line of the, of the plot. Um, and then out on the, on the edges, sort of who you might imagine. Now, one um, interesting thing that you do see here is, um, is AOC, who you might think would be um, really, really out on, on one edge. And remember, what's being captured here are the distances or the differences between voting records. And she and um, the, the other members of the so-called squad um, are actually all located together. I highlighted um, uh, AOC for you, but you can see her at the bottom of the plot there, but next to her are um, the other members of the squad. And, and so why don't they get put out way on the, on the left? Well, the reason is because sometimes, from the perspective of this model, they look like Republicans. Why is that? Because when there's a vote on a two-state solution in the Middle East, they vote with all the Republicans and not with, and not with the, or nearly all the Republicans and not with the Democrats. And when the rules of the House were voted on, um, AOC didn't vote with, with, with Nancy Pelosi. Okay, so that gives you a sense of, of the overall picture that, that exists now. Um, and then here I can show you all the different roll call votes and how they divide the membership. And so you can see a lot sort of cut between the cloud of Democrats and Republicans, party line votes, but a lot divide the parties. And those votes that divide the parties help us figure out um, which within those parties are more similar, which are farther to the, to the left, say, and which are farther um, to the right. So this is the, the, the starting point. And then we can go back in time. So now I've, I've zoomed us back uh, 10 years to the 100, or nearly yeah, a little more than 10 years back to the 110th Congress. And you start to see um, along this dominant dimension, the parties getting a little bit closer together. And we'll just keep going in this, in this manner. Okay, so now we've gone a little bit farther back to, 19, to 1997, and so we're getting towards the period of time sort of before when the major uptick that people discuss um, or, or really started to comment on, on polarization in the Congress and talking about gridlock and so forth um, about the time that that's picking up there. And so the line that I've drawn um, for you here that divides the Democratic caucus is the line that we estimate for the vote on the, on the um, motion to go forward with the impeachment investigation of Bill Clinton. And so you can see that it carved off some Democrats on the, on the, on the moderate side of the Democrat Party, at Democratic Party, and, and, of course, um, uh, and of course was supported by the, the red dots, the Republicans, um, to the right. And so one way to think about polarization and how it's shifting here is let's just think about um, what, what might have been the case if that vote had been taken 10 years earlier. Okay, and now we see a lot more, a lot more Democrats on the right-hand side of that. So we see that, that polarization is, is less here. In fact, now we start to see blue dots that are to the, to the right of many of the red dots. And as we keep going forward, um, we even see things that see, seem unimaginable today. So that the fellow whose, whose voting record was sort of the most Republican in the sense that 
that, um, or the farthest to the right in, in 1977, um, as estimated here, um, is this fellow Lawrence McDonald from Georgia is a Democrat. Okay? And we find Republicans um, like Charles Whalen um, to the left of many, of many of the Democrats. And so this is the, the sense in which we've really seen this big increase in polarization. So as we go back in time, we see the parties um, pulling closer together, and we also see um, more dispersion within the parties, so greater heterogeneity within and, um, and, less, and less difference between. And we can keep going back, um, we can keep going back in, in time, and you can kind of start to see where this is coming from. So we go back to 1967, and what we actually see here is I think the source of, 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 this, of this period in which there was less polarization, and that's the existence of what is ostensibly a three-party system. So we see the Northern Democrats on the left, um, the Northern Republicans um, are mostly on the, on the right, and then we see Southerners um, at the top. So the bigger, the bigger circles that I've highlighted here are folks um, representing um, the traditionally uh, defined Southern states, so Jamie Witten I highlight there, but they're all sort of up there at the, at the top, and I think it's gonna turn out that these guys, um, in, a, in a big way, um, at least at the congressional level, um, are what allowed for um, a lot of the, uh, the um, apparent um, lack of polarization and the sort of bipartisanship that we saw is that it was a sort of bipartisanship in existing within a tripartisan system. But as we continue to go back, we see that this is um, a, a post-war a, a post um, phenomena, so we can go all the way back to 1947, and we can see this, this same picture, basically, um, where the parties are much less separated uh, there's much less overlap. There's much more overlap along the, the primary dimension, and um, and and less and, and more variability within the the, the caucuses or, or the conference in the case of Republicans. Okay, so that's the that's the, the picture. And so you know, I, I guess then the the, the question is, um, uh, what does that tell us about polarization? So let's look at at that same uh, that same information now. Just the locations along that that first dominant dimension, and then what the average location of Democrats and the average location of Republicans um, is over this post-war period. And what we can see is the parties diverging. So that's what we, we sort of saw in snapshots, but here we can see it um, flowing across time. And again, we, we saw that a lot of that was to do with the changing um, in the South, so that we went from having um, Democrats who were sort of uh, relatively centrist within their caucus being replaced by, being replaced by Republicans, and in fact, um, I should first say, uh, the picture for the Senate looks very much the same as the House. So one thing that, um, of course, we, we um, often hear about polarization in the House is that it's the result of um, redistricting or gerrymandering. But it's really important to see that this same polarization is also happening in the Senate, um, which is um, uh, less uh, susceptible to gerrymandering. <laughs> Uh, you might think this is really just a phenomenon that's, that is the result of the um, conversion of the South from a Democrat stronghold to a Democratic stronghold to a Republican um, stronghold, and in fact, that is the case. So if you look uh, back to the immediate post-war period, you can see um, mostly what you have uh, in terms of the delegation from the South are Democrats, and they're pretty, and they're pretty moderate, pretty conservative Democrats. Um, the few Republicans that you have are also relatively relatively moderate, and as the transformation has gone, gone along, um, of course, what we now see um, is that uh, the southern um, states have among their delegations the most conservative uh, Republicans in a very large Republican delegation, and a smaller, what's left of the Democratic delegation, um, now also being um, very liberal, of course, mostly um, members of uh, minority caucuses. But it's not all about the, the South. So if we look outside of the South, we see the same increase um, in polarization um, as well, where the parties have become farther apart on average um, in their uh, delegations from outside the South as well as within. If we, um, if we just focus on the difference between um, the average position of the Democrats and the average position of the Republicans, we can make a plot like this, and this is the one that, that I think is, is probably um, more widely referred to in the um, academic literature on polarization than any other. Uh, again, it shows the mean party difference um, over a much longer period of time. And I think this, this picture is important because it sort, of dis, it sort of highlights in a way not only the massive run-up in the, in the measured po congressional polarization, um, but also 
um, that prior to the immediate post-war uh, period, there was a lot of, there was a high, very high level of polarization in the Congress then. So I think one of the things to think about is, is whether what we're seeing today is really a modern phenomenon, or maybe what was really unusual was this period from 1940 to 19, say, 85 or 90, in which we didn't see very much polarization. Okay, the lowest polarization um, in, in U.S. history. So coming out of World War II and a, a sort of consensus on foreign policy and maybe some other things, um, the particular um, political relations of the, of the parties on issues of uh, economics and race and so forth. So, so I think this is an important thing to keep in mind. You can really see the big increase, but at the same time, um, you, can, you can see that maybe the, the low level was an aberration. Okay, so... Um, uh, originally, uh, we were hoping um, today um, to hear on this panel from uh, Representative William Hurd. He, um, of course, is detained in Washington because they're not done with their business this year. Um, so instead of um, hearing from um, William Hurd, let's hear about him. And, uh, and, and I think this will really highlight a little bit um, how the Congress has changed. And I think Hurd is a really good example um, to look at because, you know, I think when you, when you hear the hand-wringing um, pundits on television talking about polarization, um, you know, they kind of, uh, they, 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 they kind of um, have expressed some disappointment in, in, in Mr. Hurd. They, they sort of say, well, there's this impeachment thing and, and he should be, you know, he's a, a moderate member of the Republican Party, the sort of fellow who should have um, or would have perhaps in the past um, uh, not taken a partisan view on, on an issue like, like impeachment. And so um, it is true um, that among the current Republican delegation, um, Mr. Hurd is a, a relatively moderate member. But of course, we're back in this world where the parties are pretty far apart in their, in their voting across all, uh, across all issues. So I've, I've labeled a lot of the, the um, Texas delegation for you guys who will be familiar with those folks. And I think, again, this uh, picture will align pretty much with, with your notion of, of um, sort of who's where uh, in, the, in the caucus from Texas. So again, this model does a great job. So those locations, from those locations, from that map, um, I can tell you how, how um, Heard vote on about 93% of his votes, about 95% for everybody else. So again, this is a powerful summary of, of, of how, these, these folks, um, how these folks vote. And so what we're going to now think about is like, well, if we look over time and we look at where in the map we placed Heard, we can ask what Republicans are notable that have served in the Congress over the last, say, 20 years is, or 30 years, is, uh, is Heard like. Okay? So these are a picture of the, of the folks who he's closest to um, out of the 501 Republicans who served in the Congress since 1979, more than three terms. And that's who he's, who he's like. So he's, he's, he's pretty close to Henry Hyde or John Kasich, or Jim, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Jack Kemp. Okay, so these are not the, the well, I think when we think about traditional moderates in the Republican Party, that's not these guys, okay? At the same time, he's really far from Jim Jordan. Okay, and even, even, even Newt Gingrich, and then um, for those of you who are t TV buffs, he's, he's also close to Gopher. Uh, Fred, Fred Grandy there from the love boat. Okay. So let's just highlight that um, a, little bit, a little bit more, and this is what I'm going to conclude with here. When you think about where the Congress is um, today and the degree of polarization and where the parties um, are located, I showed you before um, the Democrats moving left as more people um, are sort of on the other side of that line that divided the impeachment vote for, for Clinton. But let's look at it on the Republican side here with respect to Mr. Hurd. So if you look at, at Mr. Hurd's location um, in, uh, and, and compare it to other members of the Republican conference across time, if he had served in 1980, he would have he been in the 52nd percentile of, conserva of, of, uh, of conservatism in the, in, the Republican, in the Republican conference. So he would have been the median, the sort of middle of the road Republican in 1980. And you can see that over time, as time has gone by, um, moving us out to, to 2020, he's now, in the, 90, he's now in, the, in the seventh percentile of conservativeness. He's one of the least conservative members um, in, the, in the conference. And that is the story of polarization in the United States Congress. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to our well, esteemed moderator. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, Professor. So.
As John Arnold is coming up, uh, and by all means, John, go ahead and start, but we're going to get some questions. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. I am a bit nervous today because I know certainly I am uh, probably the only person speaking today who is not an expert in politics. So my goal here is really to get through the day without any of the experts directly contradicting what I say. And I think from the first two, I think I'm okay with these two. Um, I think a little background might be necessary because you might be wondering why I'm here. So about 10 years ago, my wife Laura and I started the Arnold Foundation, which originally concentrated on issues of K-12 education, but then grew to ex include both pre-K and higher ed, and then over the years have broadened into other verticals, including criminal justice, public finance, uh, and healthcare policy. And from the beginning, we realized that to be effective in policy, we had to get effective in politics. And so we started a C4 arm that was um, very active. And then about a year ago, we ended up merging those two entities together and called it the Arnold Foundation, I'm sorry, the Arnold Ventures. Um, my first career was in finance, and I ran a successful hedge fund until 2012, at which point I closed it down and joined my wife to concentrate on our philanthropic efforts. So I really come at this as an outsider. I think these two industries of finance and politics are both based on performance, but that's the only similar similarity I can find between the two. Right? In Managing money, the incentives are almost entirely around what's your financial performance. And in politics, the incentives are almost directly about the dramatic performance. And that's what I think Congress has become today. It's about political theater. There are two things that are true about the dysfunction in Congress that Jeffrey very well or, um, illustrated and that I agree with. And one is that it's not, um, that this trend isn't sudden, that Congress has been on this trend towards dysfunction for decades, um, but that this is the worst it's been in my lifetime. And there's lots of statistics one can throw out to back up this claim. One of my favorite is with the percent of bills that get introduced that get enacted. So in the 1980s, there was about 6% of bills that were introduced that would pass both houses of Congress and get signed by the president. In the 90s, that fell to 5%. In the 2000s, it was down to 4%. And in the 2010s, it's down to 3%. But this year, we're at 1%. And it's not because a lot more bills are getting introduced, or it's not a denominator issue. Right? That's been pretty constant over those decades. It's the numerator. So in the 1980s, about 330 bills a year would get passed and signed. This year, we're at 78 thus far, with a little bit less than two weeks left in the session. So you might say what really matters is substantive bills, but I would challenge you to think of a substantive bill that's been passed in Congress this year. Right? You might only think of four. Those are the four spending bills. Now, the ironic thing about that is there's supposed to be one annual spending bill, but Congress can't even do that. So it just punts by saying, we'll extend uh, the federal government by another two months and try to figure things out, and then another three months and figure things out. The next deadline is December 20th to close, and uh, I assume that they'll extend it for another few months. So as our policy work has become more federal over the years, we became much more attuned to the causes of dysfunction in D.C. And so we started this line of work about democracy. We knew um, about a lot of the causes of dysfunction, but we wanted to try to find some of the solutions. So we have interest in a number of areas at the federal level that have broad bipartisan consensus amongst them, including this year, pharma pricing, uh, ending surprise medical billing for patients, uh, increasing accountability of higher ed institutions to get rid of the bad actors. But even with this broad bipartisan support, these things are still really hard to get across the finish line I think because of this dysfunction. So we were active in getting the First Step Act passed in Congress last year. And if you look back, that ended up passing 87 to 12 in the Senate. Right. Seems like that would be a fairly easy bill. Or along the way, it had to get watered down to get the 87 votes. But even with that much support, it barely got to the floor. It took months of 
many activists trying to pressure McConnell to allow a floor vote on a bill that ended up passing 87 to 12. So for our work to be successful, we need a functional Congress, and that's why we got involved in trying to address some of the solutions. So we address it, um, or approach the work with three core tenets. Right? One is we focus on policy because we think it's the most sustainable, structurable, structural, and scalable solutions to problems come by changing the rules and incentives of systems. So we bring that perspective to the issue. What are the rules and incentives of the system that drive us to the dysfunction we have today? Second is, what can we affect? If we're powerless to do something on an issue, there's no reason to focus on it. There's no doubt that social media and the siloed news media exaggerate an already polarized electorate. But I don't know how to change the rules or incentives of those systems, and so we stay away from it. So long as there's demand by people for the highly cantankerous news, there will be supply. So third is there's no silver bullets in this work. If you think of a graph with x-axis being the probability of success and the y-axis being the impact, you'd really love to be in this top right quadrant of high probability, high impact. Right? Call that the unicorns, and in this effort to improve democracy, it's really hard to find things up there. And that being said, you don't want to be in this bottom left quadrant of very hard to get something done that's not going to have any impact anyway. Right? So that leaves the two quadrants of reasonable probability of success, but low impact, right? or low probability of success, but if you can get something done, it would have high impact. Um, and I think this issue of democracy is so important that that's why, even though we can't find that upper right quadrant, we still need to put some resources to it. So we've done a lot of thought about what the rules are that govern how our representatives get chosen and what the incentives are once they get there. I think the latter is probably the biggest impact right? when the, elect, uh, the politicians get to DC, how do they behave? But I think it's very, very hard, especially for an outsider, to influence those incentives. So we've ended up concentrating on the issues about how do the politicians get chosen. So I'm gonna quickly talk about two strands of our work on improving selection election rules and how districts are drawn. And broadly, I think the problem is our politicians are more extreme than the electorate. As Stephen was talking about, we have this exhaustive majority in the middle that's asking for something different, but an electoral system that's incentivizing candidates from the far left, from the far right. Um, so the two fixes that we're working on is to eliminate gerrymandering um, to create more moderate districts, which should get more moderate candidates, and to change the process of elections. Both of these issues have a reasonable probability of success, and I'll talk about it, although they're far from silver bullets. Um, given, again, given the importance of Congress being functional, I think it's important for us to work in it. So gerrymandering, I'm sure you've all heard of, it's both very old and very new. It was named from uh, Elbridge Gary, Massachusetts governor in 1812, and you'd notice Gary became Jerry, as John Oliver said, quote, literally everything about gerrymandering is stupid and wrong, <laughs> starting with the word. <laughs> but redistricting as we know it really got started in 2010 after Republicans lost the presidency, and they had a two-step process. Number one, they realized the power in uh, these 2010 elections, or 2011, 2012 elections after the 2010 census, and so they put national resources into these state races that had never been seen before. And the second is that once they won those races, the use of computer analy analytics to draw the districts was something that had never been seen before. So while it's predominantly Republican in nature, it's uh, not exclusive to Republicans. Um, there's the best measure of how gerrymandered a district is, I think, is this, what's called the efficiency gap, which without getting too into it, is kind of the number of wasted votes that the winning party will have. Um, and of the 12 states with the highest efficiency gaps, 11 of those are Republican. 
Maryland is the only democratic state of that sort. The 11 Republican states include Texas, by the way. So one of the controversies around redistricting is what do you prioritize? If you're not gonna prioritize uh, maximizing the number of candidates from one party, you can think of many competing interests that um, you would, might wanna prioritize. This includes compactness of district or running along jurisdictional lines of where cities are, competitiveness, right? or equal representation across political spectrum or across racial minorities. So again, this isn't a silver bullet. There's 72 congressional seats today are deemed to be competitive, which is between Democrat plus five and Republican plus five in the most recent presidential race. It's easy kind of if you get rid of some of the gerrymandered districts and use a more objective system to get that up to 100 or so. Um, again, that's out of 435 districts, so this isn't silver bullet stuff. Um, the pathway to do that there are multiple. Right? We, of course, had the Supreme Court case this year that the supporters of this lost, and it's hard to see how another Supreme Court case will come back in the medium term. Um, but state Supreme Courts have been active in this, and they've thrown out the, the maps in Pennsylvania and in North Carolina. There's been voter in initiatives. So last year, there were four states where voters got together, got enough signatures to put on the ballot an ind independent redistricting commission. Right? In those four states, Michigan, Missouri, Colorado, Utah, which span from a kind of, uh, heavy uh, red state of Utah to a purplish blue state of Colorado. State legislatures have gotten involved in some of the states where um, they're more mixed. So Virginia has rules that uh, to get a initiative on the ballot, it has to pass same language through two consecutive legislatures uh, and then go to the voters. Um, it passed last time. Now that the Democrats have control of Virginia, it'll be very interesting to see if they still have the appetite to get rid of gerrymandering. Um, and then last is through Congress. Um, H.R. 1, House Bill 1, kind of shows the priority of what the Democratic Party has on this. They passed um, their first bill that passed, got rid of all gerrymandered districts. Hard to see how that would uh, become law unless the Democrats controlled uh, both houses of Congress uh, and the presidency and maybe even getting rid of the filibuster. Um, so our second line of work is around trying to make the primaries more representative of the electorate. There's kind of three strategies here. We support all three. One is top two primaries. So if you, it's a, also called a jumble primary where all the candidates, regardless of the party, are on one primary ballot and the top two vote getters then move on. Uh, you see this in some highly partisan districts. You can get two Democrats or two Republicans running on the general election ticket. And that would obviously incentivize some moderation. And when we've seen that happen, the moderate, more moderate candidate generally wins. Uh, Washington was the first state to enact this in 2004. And since then, it's been enacted in California and Louisiana. Uh, it's a little hard to know the results of this. There's just the sample size isn't great and it's hard to really figure out, is this depolarizing? I think some anecdotal evidence out of California um, from many people I've talked to there definitely think that it's become more moderate and more civil since top two got enacted in 2010, although that also was uh, simultaneous with redistricting reforms. And so hard to know the causality. Um, open primaries, the second one, there's still 12 states that have closed primaries. That is, you have to be a member of the party when you show up to be able to vote in the primary. And so if you start looking at the spectrum of voters, if you eliminate the middle, the, eliminate people who are either independents or moderates enough to where they haven't affiliated, affiliated themselves with a party, it eliminates that moderating influence. And then third is, and the one with the most momentum probably, is ranked choice voting. Um, so 12 million Americans now live in jurisdictions with ranked choice voting. After New York City passed it last month with 71% approval, uh, it joined San Francisco, Minneapolis, a number of small cities, uh, and the state of Maine that passed it two years ago. And in ranked choice voting, voters rank candidates by their preference. And if no candidate has the majority after the first round, the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes 
their vote, those votes then go to who the voter said was their second preference. There's kind of a number of theoretical reasons why this should be a moderating influence. Um, you're more likely to get a winner that's the preferred choice of the people right, than one that's on the extremes. It gets rid of the spoiler candidate that's been an issue in a number of elections. It likely creates more civil uh, campaigning as candidates are not just worried about uh, appealing to their base, but have to appeal to, to voters who, for whom they're not their first choice. Um, and it eliminates runoff elections. So we have a runoff election tomorrow in Houston. Right? The number of voters is gonna be way down from the general. Right? The number of people who show up for runoffs tend to be more partisan than who show up for the general. It's very likely had the Republican primary use ranked choice voting in 2016 that we would have a different presidential president today. So last, I'll close. I don't wanna oversell the impact of these changes. They are marginal, but because systems tend to operate at the margin, they are important. Thanks. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, do we have more questions coming my way? As those come up, um, I'm going to move over here to take the questions and answers, and that way I'm out of the line of fire. Um, let me start with one, in, and this is for the entire panel, and I'm uh, aggregating some questions here. Uh, it wasn't that long ago where office holders of one party would actively support a presidential candidate of the other party, and then, of course, we also had a lot of party switching, uh, and the standard line, no matter whether it was a Democrat becoming a Republican or vice versa, the standard line was always, I haven't left my party, my party's left me. Do, do any of the panelists see the opportunity for that in the future, given that the two parties seem to have gone, it, it's harder for a Republican to become a Democrat and Democrat to become a Republican. So can you address that question? Because that seems to be one thing that could end some of the polarization. Uh, y y yes, I, it's certainly it's certainly true, and that's one of the things um, uh, in in our data that I didn't I didn't talk about um, is when when folks do switch parties, um, we we treat them as born again, and um, <laughs> and and they move. So it, you know, they sometimes you do get um, a, a real sort of metamorphosis, but but more often what happens is it is it is folks at the margins who are making the switch. So if you think about um, uh, you know, the, the cases that, that, that um, have happened um, that probably um, the question asker had in mind, maybe um, Arlen Specter or, 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 or Jeffords or, you know, these kinds of folks. Um, you used to see those switches, and, and again, those were folks who were pretty close to the caucus that they were switching into um, to begin with. Now, where you see people leaving the party, they, they mostly don't go to the other party. They, they declare themselves independents, and and we saw um, Amash in the, in the highlighted in, the, in one of the plots that I showed there, um, where he moved a little bit um, towards the Democrats since being reborn, um, but not that far. So I think the opportunity for, for this to really be the solution is, is not that great, because again, um, most of the folks um, who are at least in the Congress now, um, they, they are already um, sort of pretty far from, uh, from, from where they would need to be um, to be comfortable voting in the, in the opposite caucus. What's been fascinating to me over the, the Trump presidency is that the Republicans who have stood up and tried to say that's enough, thinking like a Flake or a Corker or a Mosh, uh, Will Hurd, um, have all decided that they can't win a re-election. Right? And they've all decided not to run again. And I think it has become that the president is now the leader of the party, which I think was less true previously. It's, I think, because Congress has largely abdicated its responsibility. If you go back to, I think it was James Madison in the Federalist Paper, very much believed that the legislative branch was gonna end up way too powerful in America. Right? It's gonna be the most important branch of government, and it's become the least important branch of government. 
Uh, members of Congress, again, through the incentive system, have realized it's better to push all the responsibility to their leader, the mi majority or minority leaders. Right? And then even th those leaders, like if you look at Mitch McConnell, he's very happy to push that responsibility up to the president. And so it's the association is that the strong presidency has come all the way down the party for all politicians in Congress, and it keeps everybody in line. Steve? Well, just to talk through one scenario of Republican moving to run as a Democrat, one of the tensions that we found across our research is that there's a real tension within the Democratic Party now, or at least within Democratic voters, between an activist left-wing um, ideological group, which is quite narrow but very vocal and has a kind of purity to them, especially on issues of social justice, and a much broader and older traditional liberal base, which is more baby boomers, more traditional, a little bit more patriotic, and more religious. And that tension would make it quite hard for someone coming from the Republican side to draw appeal across that spectrum. And while that progressive wing might be narrow, their vocal, uh, the fact that they're so vocal and their relevance in um, blessing political candidates would make it really hard, I think, for them to succeed within the primary and within sort of gaining traction among the party base. So I think that's one of the tensions. One of the questions we did, we have a, a future speaker from Pew. One of the questions we borrowed from Pew in our study was a, a question of asking a general thermometer. So from zero to 100, how cold or warmly do you feel towards a group? And we found that across about 30 groups that we asked, across all cross tabs that we analyzed, the lowest score in the entire study was what? The way that progressive activists score Trump voters. Six out of 100. It was the lowest across everything we did. So this is just to underscore the point of affective polarization. The hostility now means that they're really moving from one social context to another where there's a lot of division that what I think would make it hard for um, a, a right to left movement to get that born again effect. Again, for the entire panel, can you comment on where independents stand with regard to the perception of these two now polarized parties? The, the presidential primary process, the nomination process plays out in the parties, but then when it gets to the general election, you have the two candidates chosen. Uh, what do the independent voters think? And how many independent voters are there? I guess I would throw that in too. Stephen, do you want to start? You, you can, this, this is in your bailiwick, I'd say. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so most, uh, it's the largest group, right? So a major, uh, plurality of Americans describe themselves as independents, not as Republicans or Democrats. I think the numbers are roughly 25% describe themselves as Republicans, 33 Democrat and about 40. So around that um, for independence. Um, one of the largest groups that we found, uh, we refer to as the politically disengaged, these are people who are likely to refer to themselves as independents because they're not politically active on social media, in consuming news, in voting in primaries, or in voting in general elections. And they're a difficult group to define because they're very heterogeneous. These are people who are low income, low education. They're also people who are politically apathetic or very resentful of the political system and see it as a part of an establishment elite that doesn't like them. Um, and then everything in between. So there's a lot of heterogeneity there which makes it difficult to characterize them in a single phrase. Um, what we do see is that there is a moderate group we refer to as being about 15% uh, of Americans. And these tend to be middle-aged Americans, more disproportionately than average, suburban more than average, and more socially conservative, but very opposed to the hostility in the political system today. So I think where it, the Democrats might have a lead on um, independence in 2020 is that mo those moderate voters who are civically engaged and are different from the politically disengaged in that civic orientation is that they have an aversion to Trump's bombastic and confrontational style. 
but where Democrats have a disadvantage would be that these moderates also are more socially conservative and are not fond of the progressive cultural changes that we've, we've seen, in particular the kind of outrage and cancel culture that has become associated with the left. So I think independence is a really mixed picture, and I don't think that they're going to swing entirely in one direction in 2020. I would, I, if I could, I, I would just add um, two, two things to that. I, mean, I think the first thing you, you already did mention, which is, which is exactly right, that a lot of people describe themselves as independent, but coincidentally vote for the same party habitually. <laughs> so um, I think you can, you can overstate a little bit um, how, how much is really um, in play there. This is something um, that I think um, Lynn Vabrick will talk about on the next panel, um, probably in, in um, in, in more detail, but um, for sure the, the, the number of folks that are, that are you know, in that category that are gonna make their decision on this basis is a small number, but um, as, as we know in a close election, a small number uh, can, be, uh, can, be, can be the decisive factor. Yeah, um, I counter that. One of the fascinating statistics I've seen recently is that over the past 18 months, the approval rating for Trump has ranged it's pretty much flatlined. It's kind of between 41 and 45 percent, really 42 to 44 percent for 18 months. And a lot's happened in 18 months. Right? Economy uh, was weak in the fourth quarter last year. Stock market plunged. Right? Stock market very strong. Economy very strong today. A whole impeachment. A lot of other mini scandals. Everybody's made up their mind, it seems. Right? 43 percent of Americans think have an approval rating for Trump. Um, and I think we've just you're either for him or against him. It remains to be seen, I think, if one of the more progressive uh, members of the Democratic Party gets a nomination, will that have an effect? But I'm, I'm a little skeptical that the independents are gonna be a strong force. I think it's gonna be just getting out the base for this next election. Okay. Again, combining questions. Um, this was actually directed to, to Professor Lewis, but all of you can weigh in. Did you attempt to consider whether votes are generally held values or whether the votes are based on self-preservation? I mean, <laughs> heaven forbid that somebody in Congress would vote for self-preservation. Yeah. But, but let me add something to that. Sure. Take the issue like abortion. It has become a defining single issue for so many of the voters. What, what's the impact of single issues been in the past and what do you see going forward? Sure. Um, right, so, so for sure, um, uh, we don't take the, the data to be 25 million profiles in courage. Um, so, so what we're measuring are um, sort of the, in, the induced preferences, how, how people are behaving, uh, legislators are behaving in their voting um, once um, all of the sort of kinetic forces that are acting on them uh, have, have, have been applied. Um, the question of single issue voting is, is interesting because um, you know, what we've done there, as you saw, is we've reduced um, the thousands, and in some cases, tens of thousands of actual votes that individual members cast down to um, a representation of just two numbers, a, a position this way and a position this way. And so then there's a question of sort of what does that really represent? And um, you know, we call it ideology, but it's, it's not an ideology now I'll put my professor hat on in a kind of you know, Hegelian sense of what that, that means. It's just got to do with the notion that the structure of politics uh, in the US has been and is very much at this point um, about sort of lashed together issues that don't necessarily have an intellectual connection. So if, when you think about single issues like, um, like uh, abortion or, or, or gun ownership, it's not entirely obvious why those things connect with tax policy um, and uh, trade policy. In fact, we've seen a big reversal on trade policy and often, and often do over the course of U.S. history. So, you know, I think what's, what's true right now is that, is that the policies are lashed together in a particularly, in a particularly um, forceful way so that those single issues are bundled um, where we do have people that are, are, are really maybe mostly interested in just one part of a party's agenda but very strongly and are willing to, to sort of go along with whatever's the case on the other issues. I guess I'll give another um, plug for, uh, for, for Lynn Vavrick's presentation. I think she's gonna talk about exactly this issue. Anybody else wanna comment on that? No. Now for the, the 
key question of the day. We've got about two minutes left. Uh, I know, John, you mentioned some ideas of how to end the polarization. But with the impact of social media and, and even the mainstream media uh, choosing sides, it seems more and more often, how do you see this ending? So uh, my dream right, is that <laughs> somehow we get a president that one can call su super partisan, right? that it gets above the fray, that doesn't become just the leader of his or her party and can call out his own party or her own party. It's very hard, just given how we elect presidents with the Electoral College today, to get somebody who doesn't come up through the, the, the partisan system. Um, but one could have thought about um, maybe a Cheney, Cheney, Dick Cheney back in the day, not Cheney, uh, who's the? Colin Powell. Colin Powell, thank you. A Colin Powell, thank you. <laughs> they could have served that function. <laughs> we got, minds are together. Uh, <laughs> not Dick Cheney. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, but, 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 but a Colin Powell who uh, may that's have right. been above that partisan fray, maybe a Michael Bloomberg today. Right? I think that's the hope around him. There was some hope that Trump, given that he didn't come up through the party and wasn't elected through the party apparatus, would have served that role, but obviously that didn't happen. Yeah, I will build on that answer. I think that um, there's a story sometimes I tell. Um, I, back when I was in college, I had a friend named Brand, who was the president of the College Republicans, and he would say, Steve, he was from uh, Destin, Florida, also known as Heaven on Earth, that's what he used to always say. <laughs> And uh, at the time, I was in the College Republicans, and he said, Steve, um, first, I'm a Christian, then I'm an American, then I'm a conservative, and then I'm a Republican. And that laddering up from partisan to more superordinate identities that we share, I think, is the only real answer that I see as being viable, in particular, appealing to American identity the challenge with that being that on the left, there's a growing sense of shame and frustration and distancing from American identity, whereas on the right, it's increasingly becoming nationalistic. But to the degree to which a leader can appeal to civility, humility, responsibility, and appeal to these as civic virtues that we really need, I think the one reason I might be a little optimistic about this, barely, but minorly optimistic, is that to John's point about the inefficacy of Congress, whoever gets elected in 2020 will have almost no capacity to gov govern in a meaningful sense unless they have an overwhelming majority. And so they have to be thinking creatively about what are other avenues that they can appeal to in order to get their agenda pushed through. And one of those might need to be to really, really diminish the level of suspicion, hostility, and judgment that is felt and recrimination that's felt across the political system by distancing themselves from partisan cues and embracing a shared value system and appealing to shared American identity and a Judeo-Christian heritage and other things that might be able to really work across the system. So that's my prayer that that will uh, somehow emerge in the, in the immediate future, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a small hope. Well, prayer is good. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I would, I would just um, say, you know, that the longer um, political perspective is, is helpful here. This has been a very divided nation before. Um, we even saw in, in some of the pictures that I showed, um, if you go back to the 19th century and, and not at the time that we were actually shooting at each other, um, but even much, much later into the beginning of the 20th century, um, we saw this sort of um, manifest polarization uh, at least at the congressional level. And, um, and, and, and we came out of that, and, um, and now we're sort of in it again, but, um, but I, I think the, the, longer, the longer view um, is to say that, that we don't know where it's gonna go from here, but, but certainly we've seen before um, that, it's, that it's come back. Good, well, I'm glad we're ending on a somewhat positive note. Please join me in thanking our panelists this morning.